The Fine Jar by Bright Shadow. Read to you by Buggy Cass. Aizawa has had it up to here with his class claiming to be fine when they're not. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Enter the Fine Jar. Chapter 1. Origin of the Fine Jar No one knows where Aizawa gets the idea. Maybe it's been floating in his head all this time. Maybe it's a byproduct of Class 1A's month-long run of bad luck. However, the idea is born. After a month from hell, Class 1A gets an addition to their kitchen. They should know they're in for a streak of bad luck when at the start of the month, the corner store Shinzo and Kaminari are sent to to retrieve movie night snacks from catches a glancing blow from a villain attack and blows up, resulting in Kaminari with a broken leg and second-degree burns for Shinzo. Aizawa is one of the first of the UA staff on the scene, joining Shinzo and kneeling next to a pale-faced Kaminari. Are you all right? He says to Shinzo. I'm fine, Shinzo says in a voice clearly tight with pain. But Kaminari broke his leg. It looks bad. Through clenched teeth, Kaminari grits out. No, I'm okay, Sensei. Shinzo is the one who got the brunt of the blast. I'm fine, There is a bone sticking out of your leg, Shinzo says, glaring down at the blonde, even as he lets him crush his hand in a white-knuckled grip. Leg isn't going anywhere. I saw those burns. Sensei, they're second degree at least. Both of you shut up. Neither of you are fine. Recovery girl is less than five minutes behind me. She'll take care of you both. What I need from you right now is an accurate assessment of your injuries. Kaminari reluctantly admits he's pretty sure his other leg, while not as bad off as the first, is probably also broken. Shinzo equally reluctantly admits to his vision swimming and not being sure if it's the pain or a concussion. It's both. But in Recovery Girl's capable hands, both boys are recovered and back in class on a limited training schedule within a week and a half. And then three days later, Saro, while attempting to help his classmates get their various groceries back to their dorms without having to trudge up the stairs, slips on his balcony and rips his shoulder out of its socket when he catches himself. And the first word out of his mouth when Aizawa gets him down is, um, followed by, fine. He then chants this as Aizawa lays him down, as gently as possible, and assesses the damage. One visit to Recovery Girl, a slight costume adjustment to make sure it can't happen again in a more high-risk scenario, and a new dorm rule about using your quirk on the balconies, he really is fine. Next, it's Bakugo and Hagakure, a mere two days later. In a kitchen accident involving a distracted Bakugo, Hagakure being unusually quiet, and a pot of boiling water. When Aizawa rushes in to see Bakugo holding his scalded hands under the water, his eye nearly twitches at the boys growled out, I'm fine. Invisible chick got most of it. Outside, he's met with Hagakure's weak attempt at a cheerful, It's all good, sensei, as Sato sprays her scalded torso down with the cool hose water. It's one quick trip to Recovery Girl to fix them both, but Recovery Girl can't fix the way Aizawa's eye is starting to twitch every time someone starts a sentence with I'm. The class managed to evade their sudden extra bad luck for a full six days, only to lose their winning streak when Kirishima manages to take a nasty blow to the back of the head without enough warning to harden in time to save himself. 
I saw I was ready to punch a hole in the wall when the heavily concussed boy slurs out, Mookie! Multiple times as they load him onto the stretcher and carry him off. I saw his first thought is that it must be the effect of some kind of quirk, except Yue has wards against that sort of thing, and he's already checked four times to make sure nothing has failed. There's nothing to do but grit his teeth and keep going, waiting out the streak of bad luck with as much caution as he can force on his students. Every day, the bubble wrap gets more and more tempting. They make it all the way to the end of the month. A full eight days since their last incident, when naturally, naturally, Midoriya jumps into the parade of injured students by doing something as surprisingly mundane as tripping and falling down the stairs. But he wouldn't be the problem child if he didn't apply his plus ultra attitude to this too by trying to use his quirk to break his fall, failing, and managing to not only break three ribs, but to pierce a lung as well. Aizawa feels no guilt for cursing a blue streak in front of half the class when the kid wheezes out and, I- I'm fine, sensei, I'm, before he starts to choke. He's not sure if the cursing is because his student is drowning in blood right in front of him, or if it's because of that damned word again. It takes a full week in Recovery Girl's ward before she lets him return to the dorms proper, and another half of one before she lets him go back to training. Approximately two days after that, Aizawa drags everyone from their rooms to stand around one of the tables in the common room. He slams a plastic jar with a crooked white label on it onto the table. He pulls out a black sharpie and starts writing on it. As soon as he's finished, he turns the jar around and presents the jar to the class. All right, problem class, Aizawa says, holding up the jar so everyone can see the kanji written on the crooked label, reading out the definition of the word fine. I'm at my wit's end with you idiots. So, this is the fine jar. Any questions? Confused students glance from their teacher to their friends and back again. Suyu, brave Suyu, raises her hand. Sensei, you mean a swear jar? Because Bakugo-san in class, it's probably not big enough. I'm aware. It's not a swear jar. If we could fit a swear jar big enough to contain Bakugo's mouth in the dorms, I would already have one, and Yue would never need to worry about government funding cuts again. No. This is a fine jar. As in, if I ever catch the words, I'm fine, or any variant coming out of their mouths, when you are not fine... It's yen in the jar. The less fine you are, the more you owe the jar. Ida's hand flies up. Sensei, how will we know how much we owe the jar? Will we be provided with a scale? I'll put one on the fridge. Any more questions? Head shake. Fine. Then the jar is going on the counter. And remember, if I hear those words out of any of your mouths, they had better be true. Chapter 2. First Blood. Summary. It begins. The jar gets its first offerings from unexpected sources. And then from slightly more expected sources. Important notes. I have decided for a simplicity's sake to set the yen to dollar conversion ratio at a static 100 yen, 1 dollar. Because that's where the real thing hovers. It's currently rounded up, but whatever. The fine jar goes on the counter in the empty space between the microwave and the coffee pot. It's soon joined by a list of fees scribbled out in Aizawa's barely legible handwriting. On a page he tore out of a notebook. He pins the fee list to the fridge with one of Midoriya's Fruity UA Heroes magnet set. 
For this very special job, Aizawa rescues Banana Mike from Actual Mike's newest attempt to hide the frankly hideous magnet from where he doesn't have to suffer through it remembering its existence. Aizawa snaps a picture of Banana Mike and its ridiculous grin to torment Hizashi with. He's got to get his laughs from somewhere, and his friend's screaming response to the reminder of his malformed magnet self is as good a place as any. The list of fines and fees is fairly short. Aizawa's cramped handwriting takes up maybe a quarter of the page, with a few short lines of fees and descriptions outlining. Fine jar fees. Claiming to be fine with minor injuries, no blood, 5 yen. Minor injuries with blood, 10 yen. Nightmares, insomnia, and trauma-induced stress, 25 yen. Injuries requiring a first aid kit, but not recovery girl, 50 yen. Injuries requiring recovery girl's medical assistance, 100 yen. Injuries that would require a doctor visit or trip to the hospital without recovery girl, 200 yen. Injuries that would require hospitalization without Recovery Girl healing you, 500 yen. Injuries requiring hospitalization, 1,000 yen. Pay per injury type. Short, blunt, and to the point. Just like the person who wrote it. By some merciful blessing, Class 1A's streak of higher-than-usual bad luck seems to have finally broken now that they're back to their normal level of bad luck. Which means they manage to go a full five days before the jar claims its first victim. And it's not even one of the usual suspects. Aizawa sits quietly at one of the tables in the common room. He keeps one eye on Hagakure and Ashido, teaching Eri how to braid hair. Yayorozu volunteering her long, thick mane of hair as a guinea pig while Yero sits next to her, just watching the class. More than a few members of the class are scattered around them, some playing rapt attention and others doing their own thing as they linger near the group. Heads turn at a bang and a strangled yelp from the kitchen, but only Aizawa is in position to see what happened. Sato stands in front of the oven, clutching his hands with his lips drawn tight and his eyes squeezed shut. What happened? Aizawa asks, quickly standing and striding over as Sato grimaces down at the hand he's clutching to his chest. Sato startles and looks up, guilt overtaking his face. Oh, don't worry, I just slammed my fingers in the oven, Sato says, flashing a grin at his teacher. Aizawa hums. How bad is it? He asks as he gently grabs Sato's injured hand to check it over. And then Sato speaks the damning words. Uh, I'm fine. Aizawa stills. He raises his eyes from his student's injured hand to his face. Right. Aizawa says, voice flat and dry as a mouthful of cinnamon. Sato winces, sheepishly ducking his head and rubbing the back of his neck with his uninjured hand. Bend your fingers, Aizawa commands. Sato makes an attempt. Face tightening as he does his best to move his injured fingers. Aizawa watches carefully, his hand still gently caging the hand in. Stop. Sato lets out a tiny breath of relief, happily discontinuing his efforts. That's at least two broken fingers, a second degree burn, and 400 yen for the jar. Sato blinks, confused for a moment. Uh... Aizawa points to the list held to the fridge by Banana Mike. Did you think I was joking about the jar? You're lucky I'm not counting the broken fingers separately. Sato has the good sense to look cowed. Sorry, sensei, he says. Aizawa huffs. Just don't do it again. Aizawa points to the door. Go see Recovery Girl, and when you get back, put the money in the jar. Yes, sir. Um... Aizawa raises an eyebrow. Can you, uh, take my cookies out when they're done? Aizawa blinks slowly. Sure. <laughs> Thanks, Sensei, Sato says, 
rushing to follow Aizawa's pointing finger at the door like he's worried Aizawa will change his mind and make Sato dump his whole life savings into the jar while the cookies burn. The gaggle of students surrounding his youngest charge watch Sato go. As soon as the door slams shut behind him, they burst out into whispers and chatter. Aizawa ignores them. Might as well make coffee if I have to hang out in the kitchen. With that thought in mind, he shuffles about, setting the coffee pot up. Um, comes Airy's shy voice. Sir? Aizawa takes his eyes off the thin trickle dribbling into the bottom of the pot. Yes. What's the fine jar? It's Hagakure who answers her. Since I put a jar in the kitchen, and now every time someone says they're fine when they aren't actually fine, they have to put money in the jar. Oh, she pauses, habitually blank face, still for a moment. Aizawa peeks at the cookies in the oven, a wave of apple and cinnamon washing over his face. He huffs again, of course. His students have been obsessed with everything apple since learning their Aries favorite. Of course Sato tried to put off getting his hand treated to make sure they came out okay. Um, why do you have to do that? Ari asks. Um, because... Because... Hagakure flounders. Aizawa comes to her rescue. Because it makes you more aware of what you're doing, how often you do it, and losing money makes you not want to keep doing it. He says as he pulls out a pair of oven mitts. Oh, Ari shifts, fiddling with a chunk of Yayorozu's hair she's mangling into a braid. Another pause. Aizawa checks the cookies, deems them done, and lays the tray of hot cookies on the counter. Does that mean Aizawa-san has to do it too? Aizawa freezes. The class falls into a hush. Truthfully, he hadn't considered it. The room breaks into noise. Students yelling over each other for their approval. Sensei, she's right. If we have to do it, you do too. It's only fair, Ashiro says, voice rising over the noise. Lead by example, Sensei, Hagakura yells right after. <laughs> Jero is doubled overlapping, holding on to Yayorozu for support, who in turn has a hand pressed to her mouth as if to muffle her own dainty giggles. Hiroshima shouts his support for the idea so enthusiastically, he tumbles over the back of his chair. The noise grows and grows. Aizawa pours his coffee, regretting everything, and turns to the gathered students. A hush falls over them as they await his ruling. Even though there's the only one thing he really can say that won't result in a noisy riot, he has neither the energy nor the desire to quell. Sure. Why not? he says with a shrug. It's not like it's really going to affect anything. A cheer rises up. Way to go, Ari chan Kaminari shouts. Princeness of fairness and equality for all, Saro proclaims. A chant of fairness princess rises from the students, making Ari blush and duck her head. But a careful peek lets Aizawa see the small smile on her face from here, so he lets them continue. Aizawa shakes his head and goes back to his papers. The jar claims another victim before Sato even makes it back to the dorm. Ida returns from a run, legs and arms bleeding from a myriad of small scrapes, and comes into the kitchen to refill his water bottle. Aizawa, fixing himself a second cup of coffee, Glances over at his student's unusually ruffled appearance and frowns. Ida, you're bleeding. Oh, I'm fine, Sensei. I just... He trails off as Aizawa reaches over to the counter, picks up the jar, and thrusts it at him with a stern jar. Ida pauses, confused for a moment, when it clicks, and then he gasps, horrified with himself. I'm deeply sorry, Sensei, Ida says with an apologetic bow as he takes the jar. From the common room, where several of the students are distracting themselves from studying with a mini airy princess fashion show courtesy of Yayorozu and her quirk, there comes a loud, overly dramatic gasp. 
Taro, hanging over the back of the couch, points at Ida with an expression of faux horror on his face. Ida stands frozen in front of the fee list with the jar in his hands. Class Prez broke a rule, he cries. Tokayami, reading through some enormous and ominous looking book, narrows his eyes. The natural order has been twisted. Darkness descends upon us. Ida sputters at them. Hagakure strikes a dramatic pose. Only the fairness princess can save him now. Aizawa huffs, a soft sound that isn't exactly a laugh, as he reaches under the sink for the kitchen's first aid kit. Kirishima gently picks Eri up and raises him over his head. Let's go, fairness princess, he cries as he rushes forward with her held aloft to plant himself in front of Ida in a dramatic stance. Go, fairness princess, use your healing touch, he cries. Ida huffs and puffs, flustered, but obligingly leads close enough for Eri to reach him. Eri, baffled but entertained, hesitantly reaches out and carefully pats Ida's hair. I am cured, Ida says as he stands upright again. <laughs> the students cheer. Aizawa rolls his eyes, placing the first aid kit on the counter next to the jar's regular home. Put your fee in and get yourself cleaned up, Aizawa says, receiving a vibrant Yes, Sensei from Ida. Ida goes back to consulting the fee list as Kirishima plants Eri on his shoulders and rushes her back to the group. It startles a quiet laugh from her, which in turn prompts the students to stampede out the door so they can run around the courtyard with Eri, and occasionally each other, on their shoulders. In the sudden peace of the now empty common room, the sounds of his students whooping and yelling interspersed with laughter muffled behind walls and windows, Aizawa lifts his coffee to his lips. He takes a moment to close his eyes, breathe, and settle. There's a quiet clink as Ida adds his fee into the jar. I'll go assist Yaya Urzu in Iftan with assuring the class doesn't become too rough or overwhelm Eri, he says. First aid first, Aizawa says, refocusing on the ungraded papers in front of him. Yes, Sensei, Ida says, immediately reaching for the first aid kit. Aizawa makes another red mark on an unfortunate student's paper as Ida sits down at the table. He glances up at the quiet click of tweezers and finds Ida trying and failing to dig gravel out of his arms. Silently, Aizawa sets the papers aside and moves over. Give it here, he says. Ida looks up, surprised and a little guilty. Oh, Sensei, no worry, I can... Aizawa waves his protests off. It'll go faster if someone else does it. And then, because he knows how Ida's mind works, he adds, And I'd prefer you get outside to help Yayorozu wrangle your classmates as soon as possible. It works like a charm. Ida's face lightening. Oh, of course, Sensei! For a few long minutes, there's only the quiet click of tweezers and the muffled tap of bits of gravel dropping onto the paper towel laid over the wood tabletop set into the background noise of the faint shrieks and chatter of students running around outside. The only words are Aizawa's quiet command to switch from arm to leg to leg to arm. It doesn't take long for Aizawa to finish, and soon he's squinting at Ida's scraped-up limbs before deeming them gravel-free. He sits back to pull the first aid kit closer. He hands Ida the antibiotic cream as he digs through the plasters for appropriately sized ones. As Ida methodically smears perfectly even layers of cream on his scrapes, Aizawa glares at the first aid kit, disgruntled at its lack of large enough plasters. You handle that. I'll go find something to put on the larger scrapes, Aizawa says as he stands to hunt down some larger plasters. There's no need, really. They're only scrapes, Ida rushes to say. UA can afford a few bandages, Ida, and it can't hurt, Aizawa says, continuing on with his hunt. When he returns, Ida is dutifully waiting at the table. Neat spots of white cream run pink in some places on all of the scrapes. 
He's even managed to bandage some of his smaller scrapes, leaving just the ones too large to handle with the plasters in the kit. Isawa drops onto a chair and starts tearing open one of the giant plasters. Ida opens his mouth, no doubt to protest. Isawa gets there before Ida can get a word out. I'm not going to sit here and watch you struggle. Ida closes his mouth. Isawa makes quick work of tearing the packages open and sticking the plasters over what injuries are still uncovered. He sits back, evaluates his work. That's it, then. Go join your classmates. I'll clean up. This, of course, sparks a whole new round of protests. He lets Ida have this one, bundling up the plastered trash inside the gravel-covered paper towel and throwing it away as Ida sanitizes the tweezers and table before packing everything away. Ida hovers, somehow managing to make his bulk look small and awkward. Aizawa ignores it, dropping back into his seat and resuming his grading. Thank you, Sensei, Ida blurts out. Don't worry about it. Ida nods and power walks towards the door. The noise level rises for a brief moment as Ida exit, his voice cutting through the racket as he starts bringing his class in line. Which looks a whole lot like joining the fun. <laughs> it's not long after that Sato returns, yawning but healed, and adds his quartet of 100 yen coins to keep Ida's 10 yen company. He heads outside to join the rest of his classmates with a plate of cookies in tow. And if a couple of cookies end up on a napkin that finds a home next to Aizawa's elbow, well, that's fine. By some miracle, the class manages to come out the other side of their impromptu piggyback competition without any more money ending up in the jar. Naturally, this means something has to go mildly wrong in response. So Aizawa isn't really surprised that three more students fall prey to the jar in what ends up nicknamed the Ashido disaster. It starts after dinner with Ojiro, when Ashido accidentally shuts the end of his tail in the door and he insists he's okay to start the stark bruises blooming on his tail. Ojiro is rapidly followed by Ashido herself when she slips on the fleshly mopped kitchen floor while running to get Ojiro some ice and yells that she's totally good, even though the back of her hair is turning distinctly more red than pink. And then finally, Aoyama, who just finished mopping the floor, receives a bloody nose from Ashido's flailing limbs, then tries to say that it's nothing to worry about. Aizawa sighs, closing his eyes against a sudden headache of mysterious origin, and makes himself more coffee as the trio of shame-faced and freshly healed students shuffle to the jar to make their offerings. Ashida whining because of her potential head injury gave her the highest fine of all. Chapter 3. Friendly Fire. Summary. Who needs enemies with friends like these? As though the Ashido disaster is the crack that breaks the dam, it all goes rapidly downhill from there. Within three days, there's not a single member of the class who hasn't fallen victim to the jar for trying to brush off some bump, bruise, or scrape. With repeat offenders, of course, Midoriya. What, exactly, he'll have them do with the money once the jar is full is something he hasn't quite figured out yet. Maybe he'll set the class loose on the snack aisle of some poor, unsuspecting convenience store. But then that might provide too much incentive to fill the jar. He wants to say they'd realize exactly how bad of an idea that is, but, well, this class has done stupider things. He swears that the more of them that get involved in something, the stupider and more reckless it becomes. Like proximity causes their separate urges for self-sacrifice, and general teenage stupidity to merge into a singular headache-causing monster. Which is why he should have guessed something will go horribly wrong with the grocery delivery eventually. Every two weeks, Yue gets an absurdly massive grocery delivery. Well, actually, it might be massive, but it's not very absurd when you realize it has to feed nearly 700 teenagers. 
roughly 120 of which will participate in massive amounts of high-energy activity every day, on top of their general teenager appetites, plus a large chunk of faculty members that also engage in daily high-energy activities, who now reside on campus to teach, watch over, and care for said teens and that many of those people have some kind of specialized dietary needs, and then it starts to look fairly modest. Each dorm gets its own truck, which drives right up to their dorm. But from there, it's up to the students to unload the boxed-up groceries from the trucks, carry them to the dorms, unpack them, and sort them where they need to go. Aizawa can admit he's slightly proud of how his students tackle their deliveries, They've got everything down to an art form, working smoothly together to get the job done as painlessly as possible. He thinks about those skills being applied to things like rage and thinks maybe he can have some small nugget of hope for the future. Yaya Rosu keeps watch over the inside operations while Ida makes sure things run smoothly outside. The rest of the class splits into three teams. The unloaders carry boxes from the truck up the steps. Then the carrying team take the boxes to the kitchen, so the unpacking team can unpack and put away. And Aizawa gets to sit back, relax, and supervise. Most of the more physically inclined students, like Midoriya, Shoji, and Kirishima, work on the unloading. Bakugo, for all his muscles, is barred from being on any team Midoriya is also on. Plus, if he's not the one putting things away, someone will put something in the wrong spot, and he won't be able to find it when he's cooking. Which just leads to him blowing up more than is necessary. Aizawa reclines on one of the benches along the path, coffee mug in hand as he watches the efficient rhythm his class has set up with a quiet glow of pride. Students chatter and move with purpose. The atmosphere is quiet, soft, relaxed. He closes his eyes, basking in the quiet peace of the moment. Naturally, in the 2.5 seconds he's not watching, something goes wrong. There's a long, low whistle, and then Hagakura calls out, Damn, Midoriya! Are you charging for the gun show, or do we get to watch free of charge? He hears a strangled squeak that can only be Midoriya, and then a loud crash ending in an ugly, crunching sound. Aizawa opens his eyes, dreading what he knows he'll see, but knowing he needs to take in the situation anyway. Agakura hangs out the window, frozen. Midoriya stands halfway up the path, body stiff and straight with his teeth grit in pain. Directly on his feet sits a large box, two more fallen over in the ground nearby. Aizawa groans into his coffee. Ah, Midoriya, I'm so sorry! I didn't mean to make you drop them! Is your foot okay? Hagakura gasps out, vaulting out the window to rush over and help lift the box out of his foot. The other students outside crowd forward as well. Don't worry about it! Midoriya croaks as Aizawa heads over. How bad is it? Aizawa asks as Uraraka and Shoji help Midoriya sit down. Midoriya smiles up at him, face tight with pain, and says, uh, I'm okay, Sensei. Aizawa scowls at him. Midoriya winces. says, Um, I mean, it might be a little broken. A little? It might be a lot broken, Midoriya admits, eyes falling. Better, Aizawa says with a short nod. He takes hold of Midoriya's foot with careful hands and starts loosening the laces in hopes of getting the shoe off before his foot swells up too much. Of course, it's not to be. He wiggles and teases the shoe, trying to find enough give to get it off without jostling Midoriya too badly, that even just taking the laces out entirely isn't enough to get it off. You can just pull, Sensei. I I'll be fine. Aizawa turns a stern frown at Midoriya, eyes narrowing. I'm counting that towards your fine. Midoriya winces and makes the wise decision to shut his mouth. Aizawa redirects his attention back to the shoe issue. After another futile moment of gentle prodding, he sighs and admits defeat. Sorry, kid, but we have to get that shoe off and it's not coming off intact. Midoriya's face falls. Oh, 
he says. He seems more pained by the idea of having to destroy his beloved red sneakers than the actual broken foot. I saw it feels like he just kicked a puppy. But there's really nothing he can do. The shoes are doomed. Before he can do more than pause and consider how to go about doing the actual cutting, Yayarozu is there with a quiet, Here, Sensei, use these, as she pulls out a large pair of shears from her stomach. Thank you. He uses the shears to make quick work of the shoe. Midoriya watches their demise with miserable eyes. I'm sorry, Yairozu says, biting her lip. I'll give making a new pair of sh- a go, but clothes are a little harder to do than most things. And so I need to put so much focus on the exact shape and size of everything. I know my own body well enough to manage, but by the time I get a correctly sized shoe out for you, you'll have had plenty of time to go out and just buy a dozen new pairs. It's okay. I mean, even if you could, I wouldn't expect you to. And I don't even know what they were made of, so... He shrugs a little, wincing slightly as Aizawa prods at a sore spot. Whatever else Jairozu might say is lost as a loud bang sounds from inside the dorm, and Bakugo's screeching voice echoes out the door. It sounds like Bakugo and Sado are arguing again, Yairozu says with a sigh. Go ahead and sort that out. Aizawa says, easing Midoriya's foot back to the ground and picking up the other to check this one isn't injured as well. The rest of you can go ahead and keep unloading the truck. I can carry him to recovery, girl, if need be, Shoji says over Aizawa's shoulder as Aizawa pulls off Midoriya's other shoe, thankfully coming off much easier than the first one. I could lighten him. He is so he's easier to carry. Uraraka chips in from over Aizawa's other shoulder. Aizawa shakes his head, just as he suspected. There's a nasty bruise slowly swelling up on Midoriya's other foot as well. He feels around it gently. No, I've got it. Go join the others. Uraraka hesitates, glancing at her friend. Midoriya smiles at her. It's fine. I- I'd feel better if we didn't go off schedule because of me. She wavers but nods. Uh, I'll come see you after we finish, she says as she jogs back to the train of people unloading the truck, waving goodbye as she goes. Midoriya returns her exuberant wave with a tiny one of his own. He glances at Aizawa, the smiles and cheer he's been putting on for his friends dropping away for a more hesitant and nervous air. Uh, um, he starts then stops. Aizawa raises an eyebrow. I can, I, I could walk over m- myself. If you want. His eyes dart up and down the whole time, never quite meeting Aizawa's properly, as his voice stumbles and falls into a mumble by the end of his sentence. Aizawa raises the other eyebrow. On a broken foot? I don't think so. And I'm not convinced the other one isn't broken, too. It's at least badly bruised. I'd be okay. I I mean... You don't have to worry. It's it's no bother. I've done it before. Aizawa stares. You've done it before? Yeah, so if you'd rather not uh, um concern yourself, I-, I could get there on my own. I-, I mean, I got myself hurt, so it's only fair I handle it, right? Aizawa doesn't know who taught the kid these things. To expect people not to care. To not want to care. He doesn't know who they are or why they did it, but he'd like to find them and do something distinctly unheroic. No. No? If Ari got hurt and needed to see the nurse, would you expect her to drag herself there? Midoriya looks aghast. No! He yelps. No, even if it were really inconvenient for you. Even if it was her fault she got hurt in the first place? No, no, of course not. That's, it's... When someone gets hurt, someone should help them. When you get hurt, someone should help you. Midoriya twists his hands in his lap and doesn't look up at him. I'm sorry no one helped you when you needed them to, Aizawa thinks. He can't do anything to help the Midoriya of the past, but he can help the Midoriya of the now. 
He sighs and turns his back to Midoriya, shifting into a crouch. Climb up. And then, remembering who he's talking to, he adds, And don't use your feet. There's a very pregnant pause before then. Midoriya tentatively grabs onto Aizawa's shoulders. Aizawa huffs and pulls Midoriya's arms into a more secure grip. Hold on tight. I'm going to stand. It takes a bit of awkward shuffling, but Aizawa manages to gently manhandle Midoriya into a piggyback position. Midoriya stays uncharacteristically quiet the whole trip to Recovery Girl. Aizawa doesn't push him to talk. Recovery Girl shoots Midoriya a disappointed frown when she opens the door to answer Aizawa's knock. Not his fault this time, Aizawa says. She raises an eyebrow at him and moves Midoriya down on one of the cots. What happened? she asks. Hagakura asked if he was charging for the gun show and he dropped a box on his foot. Recovery Girl doesn't laugh, but there's a definite amused air to her as she nods and says, Ah, I see. Midoriya's face burns bright red. While Recovery Girl gets her portable x-ray machine set up, Aizawa deems the situation handled and heads for the door. Um, Midoriya squeaks. Aizawa turns back to him. Thank you for, um, for helping. His voice goes from strong to soft the further he stutters out the words, until Aizawa can barely hear him. Aizawa steps back over and drops a hand on Midoriya's head. You're welcome, problem child. A pause, and then, you still owe the jar, though. A laugh startles out of Midoriya, and Aizawa tucks his chin into a scarf to hide a smile. Yes, sensei, Midoriya says, had not quite tilted far down enough to hide his own smile. He steps out into the hall and makes to go back to the dorms, dreading whatever nonsense they'll have gotten into in his absence. But then he stops. He thinks about the things Midoriya unintentionally implied about his past experiences with teachers. He thinks about kids born with powerful quirks and all the ways adults tend to fail those kids. He grabs two juices from the vending machines instead and goes back to the infirmary. The look of surprise and then tentative happiness on Midoriya's face when Aizawa drops a juice box in his lap and then drops one into the waiting room chairs with a quiet, wake me when it's time to go, is worth whatever trouble the rest of the class will get into while he's gone. Which turns out to be Uraraka sitting sheepishly on one of the couches, with a cup of milk in her hands and a towel pressed to her face. Midoriya snores softly on his shoulder as teacher and student stare each other down. It's Ashido who breaks the tension, gliding on a trail of acid slime at high speed. She catches herself on the couch with one hand, the other raised above her head in a triumphant fist. We did it! We found the last tooth! Yuraka's eyes dart between Ashido and Aizawa. Ashido looks over. What's? Oh, hi, Sensei! She squeaks, <laughs> letting the tooth in her hand plop into the cup of milk. So, um, Uraka kinda sorta caught a couple of cans with her face. But we managed to find all the teeth! So, he looks at Odoraka. She slowly lowers the towel and gives him an apologetic smile, revealing three gaps where teeth should be. Well, at least she isn't saying she's fine. Chapter 4 Anything you can do, I can do better. He puts Midoriya in bed and does not tuck him in. He drapes one of his hero merch throw blankets over him and definitely does not notice. The blanket he's grabbed is some sort of obviously unofficial merch featuring a group shot of various underground heroes with himself tucked into one shadowy corner. He also does not have any sort of soft feelings of any kind about this thing that he obviously does not notice. He pulls Midoriya's door shut behind himself with no soft smile on his face. Then he goes downstairs, retrieves Uraraka, and calls a thoroughly unimpressed recovery girl, and takes Uraraka to take advantage of Yue's fantastic dental care. It takes maybe an hour to get all three teeth restored to their rightful places and then carry a sleepy and slightly loopy Uraraka back to the dorms. He learns, through stumbling, slurred sentences, 
that Uraraka took not one, not two, but four cans to the face because someone dared her to reenact a Disney movie. She passes out fully before he can find out who the someone was, but that's okay. He has ways of making his students talk. Aizawa enters 1A's dorm with a student snoring on his back for the second time today. Thankfully, there's not a third injured student waiting for him. A few heads turn towards him as he kicks the door shut with a bang. Uraraka does not stir, as he knew she wouldn't. He stands in the doorway to the common room with as much authority as he can muster, considering there's a teenager drooling on his shoulder. All right, he says to the student still lingering in the common room. Which one of you dared her to do it? His intimidation factor is slightly dimmed by Uraraka snoring like a chainsaw, head lolling on his shoulder, but it's still enough that the students jolt. Everyone glances nervously at each other. Aizawa glares, slowly sweeping the room in search of the weakest link. His eyes catch on the slight movement of Juro waving one of her ear jacks. He raises an eyebrow. Juro slowly moves her ear jack to point to Kaminari. Kaminari, detention. Kaminari squawks, but how did you- Juro fails her valiant battle to hold back her laughter and breaks into sputtering giggles. Kaminari's head jerks towards her. Jaw falling open and an expression of profound betrayal on his face. Juro! How could you? Easily and with great enthusiasm, Juro responds, deadpan. Kaminari wails. Uraraka snorts and jerks awake, flailing. One of her hands smacks right into Aizawa's face. She pats him, mumbles something unintelligible, and flops right back onto his shoulder. Already out again. Oh no, he thinks as his feet slowly lift off the ground. Down below his students yelp and scramble towards them, but by the time they make it to them, they're already out of reach. He doesn't dare move too much lest he lose his grip and drop Uraraka from the slowly increasing height. All he can do is hiss, Uraraka, Uraraka, wake up! She doesn't wake up. The only thing keeping her secure on his back is his grip on her legs and an awkward, hunched position to keep her from sliding off. It's a choice between dropping his student to grab his scarf to tether them down or floating helplessly off. It's an easy choice to make. Well, at least we're inside, he thinks as he resigns himself to his fate. They bump against the ceiling and gently bob along it. He sighs deeply. Down below, his class frets and flutters, scrambling for a solution. Sarah emerges from the kitchen, takes a moment to stare at his teacher bobbing along the ceiling with his classmate snoring on his back, and silently lifts his elbow. The strip of tape catches Aizawa in the torso, just close enough to his hand that he can grab on without compromising his hold on Uraraka. The class cheers as Saro reels them down and tethers them to the couch. Thank you, Saro. You're welcome, Sensei. Now that he and Uraraka are safely within range of the ground, the only problem is how to keep her from accidentally floating anything and anyone else. Yairorozu comes to the rescue with a pair of four-fingered mittens. She and Ida relieve Aizawa of Uraraka to carry her up to her room while Aizawa ties himself down to one of the armchairs until Uraraka can wake up and cancel her quirk. He passes the time grading, occasionally coming loose enough to bob along like a teacher-shaped balloon, laptop balanced on his knees. Uraraka wakes up an hour later, shrieking as she rushes downstairs. She slams her fingertips together, babbling apologies. It's quiet for a few days, after what the class takes to calling the Deku Squad double whammy. The jar claims a few minor fines. All simple day-to-day bumps and bruises. Nothing major. Which means Aizawa should be expecting it. Should be. But he isn't. Bakugo is, after all, never to be outdone by Midoriya. Even in things that are not and never should be a competition, even when he's not actively trying to compete. 
It's like competing with Midoriya is just the natural state of Bakugo Katsuki's existence. The knock on his door is quiet, but there's a frantic quality to it that still wakes Aizawa up, in spite of how little sleep he's gotten. He cracks an eye open and glares at the cheery red numbers on his alarm clock, informing him that it's a bright and early 6 a.m. Whoever is at the door, they aren't there with good news. At least, they better not be. Because between patrol, grading, and dorm duties, he didn't make it to bed until 3 a.m. If someone is waking him up for something that isn't an emergency, well, I saw I can't be held responsible for what he does. He hauls himself upright with a groan. Struggling on a shirt and pulling on his slippers, he trudges towards the door and the tentative knock that comes again just before he throws it open. Someone better be bleeding, he growls. Uh, um, says Kaminari, pale, white, and shaky. His eyes dart away. He's wearing a bright yellow shirt with a cartoon Pikachu face on it. It makes it easy to see the dark smears and spots dotted on it. And then his hands speckled with faint smears of red. Aizawa closes his eyes, pleading to the uncaring and merciless void, and takes a deep breath. Please tell me someone isn't actually bleeding. Silent. Should have known better than to tempt fate, Aizawa thinks. He forces himself to take another deep breath. Kaminari isn't nearly as stupid as he likes to pretend. If someone were bleeding out, he wouldn't have wasted time coming to Aizawa. So, no one is dying, at least. How serious is it? It's just a kitchen accident, Kaminari squeaks, and then deflates into a fluttering mess. But, um, we probably need recovery, girl. Aizawa stares at him until he breaks. Definitely need recovery, girl. Or an ambulance, um, if she's not here? Aizawa makes himself think of kittens. Cute, fluffy kittens that can go one- whole day without anyone ending up bleeding or with broken bones or some other hospital-worthy injury. He drags a hand down his face, fighting the urge to groan as he mourns the sleep he's going to lose. Give me two seconds. Aizawa yanks on proper shoes and follows Kaminari to 1A's kitchen. Hiroshima and Bakugo are there, Hiroshima hovering over the chair Bakugo sits in, hunched over and looking ready to explode. It's not an uncommon scene. Perhaps Bakugo seems two seconds closer to exploding than usual, but considering he has a kitchen knife embedded in his shoulder at an awkward angle, Aizawa feels like maybe this time Bakugo has a right to it. Maybe need recovery girl my ass, Aizawa thinks. Aizawa steps quickly over and drops into a crouch next to Bakugo, bringing one hand to his uninjured shoulder. Hiroshima shuffles over to make room as Kaminari joins him in hovering. Bakugo drags his glare over to Aizawa and grits through gritted teeth, the closest to a greeting Aizawa expects to get. What happened? I wanted fish for breakfast and fumbled the fucking knife. Bakugo snaps. Aizawa hums, eyes flicking between the knife and the guilt-ridden expressions on Kirishima and Kaminari's faces. Right. Fumble the knife. Somehow stabbing himself in the shoulder. Sure. He sets that aside for now and focuses on the more immediate problem. It's a flaying knife thin and sharp and sunk two, maybe three inches in the Bakugo's shoulder. Not horrifically deep, but deep enough to pose a problem. At the very least, someone, probably Bakugo himself, had the good sense to wrap and stabilize it. Well, you definitely need to see Recovery Girl. But you're also not walking there yourself, and considering the position of the knife, I can't put you in a rescue carry. There's really only one way to do this. A pause. Bakugo squints at him, and then it clicks. He bristles like an angry cat. What the fuck? Hell no! Aizawa fights the urge to sigh and pinch his brow. Bakugo, 
We don't have a stretcher in the dorms. This is the fastest and easiest option. I'm not getting fucking princess carried to the fucking nurse! He gets princess carried to the nurse. Aizawa is honestly surprised and suspicious that he doesn't have to threaten Kirishima or Kaminari out of taking a picture to tease him with. If Bakugo actually managed to stab himself without any outside help, he'll eat his goggles. They make their way to the nurse's office at a brisk pace. Recovery girl already alerted and prepping for their arrival. Bakugo sulks so much, Aizawa is surprised there's no smoke. Suzenji waits for him at the door to the building. A coat thrown over her pajamas and one of the nurse bots at her side. He follows her directions, setting Bakugo on the cot as she herds him towards, and then steps back to let her do the work. It's a few minutes' work for her to evaluate the injury and prepare to extract the knife. As she does, Aizawa mulls over his suspicions. In his experience, when people have accidents with kitchen knives, they're things like cutting board mishaps. Self-stabbings are usually just dropping the knife and it landing on their feet. Anything else, and anywhere else, usually requires another participant. Or two participants who practically radiate guilt and completely fail to tease their injured friend. So, want to tell me how you, of all people, accidentally stab yourself? Bakugo stays silent long enough that Aizawa wonders if he'll have to push a little harder. And then he bites out. Dumbasses were fucking around, shoving each other and shit. They bumped me. I fumbled the knife, and here we fucking are. Aizawa nods, not looking down at his most volatile student. Yeah, that's just about what I expected. It's clearly not the whole story, though. But he can get that out of Kaminari and Kirishima easily. Guess he is gonna have to draw up those kitchen rules after all. Bakugo rolls his eyes. You don't need to make such a big deal out of it. Aizawa raises his eyebrow at him. You were stabbed. Fucking barely! Aizawa can feel years of his life being peeled away. There is no such thing as barely stabbed. You're either stabbed or you're not stabbed. I'm fucking fine! Bakugo hisses. Aizawa's eye twitches. Jar. Ugh! Bakugo grumbles, but wisely doesn't argue. He leaves Bakugo for Recovery Girl's capable hands to fret over as he returns to the dorms. He finds Kirishima and Kaminari lingering in the kitchen. Atmosphere heavy, which is perfect because he needs to talk to them anyway. Standing in the doorway of the kitchen, he clears his throat. Their eyes jerk up to him, and they bolt to their feet. He stands in front of them, arms crossed, staring. Neither can meet his eyes for very long. Shoulders hunching and miserable, eyes downcast. All right, what happened? They're quiet for a long few seconds, trading guilty looks. Before Aizawa can push any more, Kaminari bushes out with, It was my fault! Kirishima jerks and says, No, man, it was my fault. I'm the one who zapped you, but I'm the one who started chasing you. So I started it. You're not the one who knew he had a knife. Maybe if I wasn't so stupid, I would have noticed. Enough, Aizawa snaps. Both boys jerk and fall silent, eyes dropping again. Aizawa breaks a critical eye over them and then the room. Now that he doesn't have a stabbed student to deal with, he notices the cutting board and half filleted fish knocked askew. Purses his lips at the telltale splatter of blood on the floor, leading to the chair he found Bakugo in. Notes a few other things knocked sideways and a few papers scattered on the ground. He turns his eyes back to his students. Hiroshima, full story. Go. I came into the kitchen after my morning workout, Hiroshima starts half mumbling the story into the floor. I saw Bakugo and tried to, you know, punch his shoulder and play around, but he snapped at me and said not to screw around while he was holding a knife. So I got my shake and sat down at the table, started talking. Then Kaminari came in and I didn't... 
Aizawa holds up a hand. Pause. Kaminari, start from there. I came in, but neither of them noticed me, so I thought it would be funny if I zapped them as a stupid prank. So I zapped Kirishima and ran away, and he chased me, and I tried to get Bakugo too, but then Kirishima tackled me in the knife. So it was my fault! I should have noticed! Stop, Aizawa says curtly. Right. Self-depreciation isn't going to get either of you anywhere. The boys stare at their feet, and Aizawa sighs. Basically, what happens is you were goofing around, like normal teenagers, somewhere you shouldn't have been, and there was an accident. You made a mistake. A stupid one, but a normal human mistake. Both boys try to protest. Aizawa silences them with a glare. This isn't actually that big a deal. Yes, it was stupid. Yes, they never should have been horsing around in the kitchen. But they're kids, and it's not like most adults think twice about it either. Besides, Bakugo isn't hurt all that badly, and honestly, it's a bit of a freak accident that he was even hurt badly at all. They've all gotten worse in training, honestly. But it's clear that the boys are feeling a lot more guilt than their actions really warrant. Not that unexpected, considering their career choice. In his experience, hero students are some of the worst offenders when it comes to shouldering responsibility and guilt for every bad thing, no matter how illogical it is. But this class has got to be one of the worst cases he's seen so far in his career. Still, even if they are taking this too much to heart, they did screw up. Measures need to be taken. Punishment stalled out. Of course, that doesn't mean you're escaping punishment, he says, trying not to frown at the almost relieved looks growing on their faces. You'll both be helping Ida draw up new kitchen safety rules. The horror on their faces speaks volumes, but they don't argue. He looks at them, wilting and miserable, and sighs, softening. It turned out fine so don't worry about it too much. Let it be a lesson, and but don't let it weigh you down. Neither of the boys seem reassured, or even smoke up at all. He's not good at this part of his job. He's not all might. He can't take the weight of their shoulders just by showing up. All he can do is crouch down to their level, put a hand on each of their shoulders, and gently squeeze until their eyes drag up to meet his. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to make worse mistakes. That's the consequence of being human. But no one expects you to be perfect. Bakugo is going to be fine. Covery girl will have him back in class before homeroom. He stands up, letting his hands fall away. The boys watch him, just a little less utterly miserable than before. That's the best someone like himself can ask for. Get to work on the kitchen. I'll see you both in class. The rest of the day goes exactly as I saw expects it to. Bakugo stomps into the classroom to disguise how much his feet drag and blows off Kirishima and Kaminari's attempts to apologize. Neither of the boys give up, continuing to throw apologies at Bakugo all the way through lunch, where Bakugo regains enough energy to blow up at them more literally until it accumulates with Bakugo demanding sparring matches as punishment for accidentally getting him stabbed, trashes them both, and demands their punishment for losing be that they stop acting like a bunch of sad sack dumbasses, which, as I was about 90% certain, means both of that he forgives them and that he wants them to stop moping around and acting like kicked puppies. Naturally, Aizawa chooses that moment to pounce, reminding Kirishima and Kaminari that part of their punishment may be done, but they've still got part two to get through, and Ida is extremely happy to finally be given permission to formally write up a proper kitchen conduct code. He set up meetings with itemized schedules. Aizawa makes no attempt to curb this. A punishment is a punishment, after all. And maybe also for a tiny bit of harmless revenge for everything these kids put him through. Chapter 5. Hell Month 2. The Electric Boogaloo. 
Coda has a problem he won't talk about, but with the rest of the class staging an unplanned sequel for the Helm Months, it's all too easy to forget about the problems of his quietest student. Saying Coda is being quiet is a little like saying the night is dark, and yet that's exactly what Aizawa finds himself noticing. Coda has always been quiet, especially at the start of the year. But over the course of the year, Aizawa watches him open up, making friends with the more mellow students, like Sato and Tokoyami. More recently, Jiro and Koda's partnership in the final exam seems to have turned into a strong friendship. Now more often than not, he finds her hanging out in the courtyard with Koda and his other friends, quietly playing instruments and passing Koda's rabbit around. By virtue of Sato and Tokoyami's presences, they're often joined by Saro, Shoji, and Midoriya. Jero's addition means that Momo and Hagakure often gravitate over as well. The further into the year they get, the larger Koda's friend group grows. And the larger Koda's circle of friend grows, the more Koda's signing grows. Literally. It spirals out from as unobtrusive and as contained as possible to wider, more expressive gestures. It's nowhere near Mike's wild, over-exaggerated movements, which should classify as a workplace hazard with the number of times he smacked someone in the face, but it's enough that it's clear that he's comfortable and happy. Even more telling is that sometimes Aizawa hears Koda's soft voice join in the rest of the classes, still much quieter than the average teen, but a welcome change, anyway. But somewhere between the month from hell and the dorm's first accidental stabbing, something happened to one of his quietest students. He's withdrawn, shrinking back in on himself more and more. At first, Aizawa assumes it's just stress, school, or the class's most recent traumatic experience. But it continues on and grows worse. No matter how hard he racks his brain, Aizawa can't in what triggered it. But he intends to find out. His first and simplest plan is to pull Koda aside after school and just ask. He's not really expecting to need a second plan. It's Koda. Social anxiety aside, Koda is one of his easy students. If any student in 1A qualifies as easy. The final bell of the day rings. The class begins to file out, save for the unlucky souls slated for classroom duties. Koda, Aizawa calls as the student in question passes his desk. Sensei, Koda signs, the tilt of his head questioning. Walk with me, Aizawa says, heaving himself to his feet. He leads Koda into the empty classroom across the hall. There's nothing in there but a few spare desks pushed to the walls, and the teacher's desk sitting up against the front of the classroom. Aizawa leans against it. Koda stands in front of him with hunched shoulders and hands that won't stay still, rising and falling and twisting together. I won't keep you long. I just wanted to ask if everything is all right, Aizawa says. Koda freezes, wide-eyed like a deer in the headlights. His hands rise and stutter to a stop until he visibly forces himself forward. I'm fine, don't worry, Koda signs. Aizawa fights the urge to groan. Right, sure you are, he thinks. You've been very quiet lately, Aizawa says, prodding as gently as he's able. Koda gives him a tiny little shrug and signs, I'm always quiet. Aizawa raises an eyebrow at him. Koda shrinks a little, but says nothing. Aizawa doesn't purse his lips. He doesn't let any of his frustration with the blatant lie show on his face. He just looks at Koda letting his eyes bore into him as if his quirk will spontaneously develop the power to erase the ability to lie as well as quirks. Sadly, it doesn't. If only it would, his life would be much easier. It would probably be handy for hero work as well. Whatever is happening, Koda clearly isn't going to give it up without a fight, and trying to force it out of him will only make things worse. Aizawa has no real concrete proof that something is wrong, after all, so there's nothing to stop Koda from clamming up. Time to retreat and come up with a plan B, then, Aizawa thinks. 
All right, Aizawa says, breaking the long silence. Koda relaxes. But I want you to know, if you decide you're not fine, then any of your teachers will be happy to help you with any problems that you may or may not find yourself having. Koda hesitates, and for one beautiful moment, Aizawa thinks this might actually get resolved quickly. But Koda just nods quickly, and Aizawa reluctantly lets him go, even though all he wants to do is pick his student up by the ankles and shake him until the problem falls out. And while that's immensely satisfying to picture, it's unlikely to work and also socially frowned upon. Plus, Koda is a sizable kid and he'd have to stand on a desk or something to do it, which is just undignified. All he can really do is resolve to keep a closer eye on his quietest student. Unfortunately, that's resolve that very quickly gets chucked right out the window. Not long after settling into the dorms, Class 1A designates Saturday as their official class movie night. With each grocery order, snacks are set aside specifically for movie night. And yet, somehow, every single movie night, the class finds themselves woefully bereft of movie-appropriate snacks and in need of a quick snack run. Except for that one time at the start of the month from hell, where Kaminari and Shinzo got caught up in a villain attack, there's never been a problem with this. Well, except for Ida and his righteous rage that his hungry classmates have yet again eaten the movie snacks outside of their designated time for consumption. So, Aizawa really has no reason to refuse Tokoyami and Shoji when they request permission to make the now weekly snack run. It's a convenience store this time, the class having made a silent agreement to avoid the corner store for a little bit out of respect for both Aizawa's nerves and the way Kaminari and Shinzo both still get a little twitchy walking down that street. Aizawa gives his permission, signs their passes, and indulges in a moment of painful resignation when, barely twenty minutes later, the phone rings. Bubble wrap. One of these days, he's really going to do it. Red lights flash in the twilight, casting flickering shadows over the scene. Aizawa takes in the wrecked storefront. The awning of the store rests on the concrete in front of the shop, an upside-down car clearly marking what caused it to fall. There's an ambulance with a pair of EMTs tending to the small group of people. He finds a student sitting on the curb a few feet from it with bulging plastic bags at their feet. Aizawa flashes his license at the officer manning the caution tape without breaking stride or so much as glancing toward them. The boys look up as he approaches, their body language sheepish. He sighs. He knows it's not as if his students are trying to get into trouble, but this is getting ridiculous. At this rate, if Midoriya isn't careful, someone is going to usurp his position as class problem child, Aizawa says as he stops in front of them. Neither boy laughs, but some of the tension bleeds out of them. Aizawa lets his eyes drag over the boys, looking for injuries. How bad is it? he asks. Shoji injured himself, shielding me when the awning came down, Tokoyami says. Not all of you. I know it at least got your legs, Shoji says. I bear no injury which will meet my end. Your injuries are far more extensive than my own, Tokoyami says. I'm fine, Shoji says. Aisawa feels the now familiar resignation and frustration settle in. This is the corner store all over again, he thinks. You bore a great and terrible weight in my name. You have more than earned the right to treatment first. Shoji shakes his head. I'm tough. Besides, there are a lot of civilians we couldn't protect that need treatment far more than either of us. You know what? I'm not doing the song and dance again. Let's do this the fast way. Aizawa turns towards Shoji. Shoji. How injured is Tokoyami? Shoji pauses, confused, but answers, which is honestly all Aizawa cares about right now. I'm certain he hit his head at least once and part of the awning sliced him when it came down. Plus, I didn't manage to shield his leg, so he definitely took a hit there. Tokoyami's feathers puff out indignant. 
Aizawa nods, short and curt, and turns to Tokoyami before he can voice any kind of protest. Tokoyami, how answered is Shoji? Shoji only knows of my laceration because of how deeply it cut him, and I am certain for each of my bruises he bore thrice at the very least. Are either of you still bleeding? No, answers Shoji, ever to the point. We have bound our wounds sufficiently, Tokoyami answers. Then you'll live until we reach recovery, girl. Up. He herds them both into the car, easing the EMT's concerns with recovery girl's name and another flash of his license. And then he does the adult thing and calls ahead, even though it means he has to endure recovery girl scolding once over the phone and again as his students are treated and bundled off to bed on tired, wobbly feet. And if a few bags of snacks mysteriously end up on one of the common room tables, well, no one can prove he did it anyway. Curfew arrives, and when Aizawa comes to check up on his class, he finds, to absolutely no surprise at all, that each and every one of them are out of bed. Even Tokoyami and Shoji, who must have snuck out to join their friends at some point. Not a single one is awake. They're all tangled in each other in various little piles. Mouth open and snoring. Across pillows, couches, and chairs. A few have blankets haphazardly thrown around themselves. It definitely does not remind him of kittens piled together for warmth. He huffs, shaking the image from his head, and moves forward to wake them. He hesitates, his hands inches from Ashiro's slowly rising and falling shoulder. He hovers there for a moment and then shrugs with a sigh, reaching instead for the blanket half fallen off her lap. It's fine, he tells himself. It's Saturday. There's no school tomorrow, so just this once, it's okay. Moving with every inch of stealth honed over years of hero work, he moves from group to group, pulling blankets over bodies and tucking pillows under heads, until there's not a single student left lacking. He takes a step back to sweep his eyes over the class, double-checking they're all sufficiently not tucked in. He didn't. He didn't tuck them in. He is not that soft. He just bundled them up. Just so he doesn't have to listen to them whine about sore necks tomorrow. Of course. That sufficiency is all. Their faces glow in the soft light of the TV, the movie's title card playing on repeat. In its flickering light, their faces look softer. More like the kids they try so hard not to be. If he pauses a moment too long before he turns the TV off and retreats back to his own room, well, there's no one left awake to tattle on him. It's fine. For tonight, everything is fine. It's not fine. It's the month from hell all over again, but worse. Two days after Shoji and Tokoyami got caught between a drunken disorderly customer and a terrified cashier, Jiro gets one of her ear jacks slammed in a door. She earns herself a sizable fine, insisting it's not that big a deal despite the bruises and bleeding and the near 90 degree angle, making it clear it's badly broken. It is, in fact, a big deal. It's enough of a big deal that Recovery Girl calls in a quirk injury specialist to help guide her through healing it. Not even 24 hours later, Momo slips in the rain and breaks her arm. Then she tries to insist it's nothing, and just fine, Sensei, really, because it's study night, and she promised Ida that she'd help out, and she doesn't want to disappoint anyone. That one leads to Aizawa laying face first in the couch in the teacher's lounge. She's supposed to be the sensible one. He groans into the couch with his zashis and Vlad's unsympathetic snickering for background music. There, there, Aizawa, I'm sure everything will improve in the morning, Yagi says, patting his shoulder sympathetically. Aizawa turns his head to glare at him. Don't jinx them. They don't need that kind of help. Yagi holds his hands up pacifying, and makes a strategic exit. The next day, Ojiro dislocates his tail during training and neglects to tell anyone for full 20 minutes. 
Then, when Yagi notices and asks if he's okay, he tries to brush it off with an I'm fine, All Might Sensei! Aizawa finds himself torn between being smug that somebody else finally faced the dreaded I'm a fine and being pissed that Yagi jinxed them. Coincidentally, a gift basket full of various fruit-flavored gourmet jelly pouches appears on his desk. Aizawa decides to generously forgive Yagi for jinxing the class. This time. The month does not improve. A week later, Ida and Midoriya literally run into each other while jogging. And instead of going to the nurse, come to class covered in mud and blood. Ida's eye is swelling so badly it dislodges his glasses. Midoriya's still bleeding nose is bruising in a way Aizawa knows means he broke it. And then they try to apologize for coming to class a mess and getting the floor dirty. Aizawa frog marches them to Recovery Girl, giving them both a rundown on what fines they've incurred along the way. Four tense days later... Todoroki accidentally badly burns Asui's tongue and then proceeds to have the world's quietest panic attack. Asui, feeling responsible, tries to put off going to the nurse to try to stay to help. Aizawa sends her packing, owing a fine to the jar, as soon as Recovery Girl turns her loose. Todoroki comes out of his panic attack and tries to go right back to training. Asui proves that being in Class 1A causes you to lose all sense, by coming back to class even though she's dead on her feet and tries to do the same. He sends them both back to the dorm to pay their fines and rest. And if he finds them sprawled on the couch together in the boneless sleep of pure exhaustion, with tear tracks drying on their faces, then that's just a bonus. Asui adopting a baffled Todoroki as a younger sibling is a second, more unexpected bonus. But it's Shinzo who proves himself a true member of Class 1A, despite transferring in halfway through the year, and gets closest to giving Aizawa a heart attack. By passing out in the middle of an exercise mid-swing on his capture scarf while 20 feet in the air. Because apparently his insomnia has been acting up horrifically, and he didn't do the sensible thing and tell literally anyone. Naturally, the class's attempt to rescue him collide into one horrific mess, like watching cars pile up on a highway. He has to send the entire class to Recovery Girl, with broken noses and sprains aplenty, including Midoriya, who, in the end, was the one to actually catch Shinzo, grabbing Shinzo in one hand and the dangling capture scarf with the other and promptly dislocating both shoulders in what the class decides to call the Shinzo pile-up. Aizawa does not crush his pseudo-kid in a solid minute-long hug, no matter what photo and video evidence taken by his terrible friends might imply. He also doesn't leave a box of any of the one-of-a-kind prototype eraser head shirts on Midoriya's balcony. The shirts which do not exist and are not in Midoriya's possession, were bought and paid for by Hizashi, who just won't give up on convincing Aizawa to make some official merch. Midoriya finding a box he claims is full of eraser head shirts on his balcony and screaming so loudly every bird on campus takes off in fright is a complete coincidence. It couldn't be Aizawa. He's busy hiding from Recovery Girl's wrath in the teacher's lounge. But listening to Mike's uncontrolled laughter when he finds out what happened almost isn't worth it. Although throwing a couch cushion at Mike hard enough to knock him over does make him feel a little bit better. Home month two, however, doesn't get better. Though Aizawa does avoid sending the whole class to the infirmary at once for a second time. It's no wonder that by the time everything starts to calm down, He's completely forgotten about Coda's mysterious problem. And it's just his luck that that's when everything comes to light in the worst way possible. That was the first half of The Fine Jar by Bright Shadow. I am Buggy Cash, your coffee aunt. 
And I would like to say, my nibblings, if you want to talk to me, please go to Eleanor Elizabeth's Discord chat, where I spend a lot of time. I don't sleep. I'm terrible. Please get better sleep schedules than I have. Please check out the channels of the three people who inspired me the most. Eleanor Elizabeth, Goddess Nibbling, Rat Overlord, Number Two Nibbling, Number One Headache, and Cal, Inspiration Nibbling. I love you all, and have a good day.